So you can use this? Um, is this the laser pointer? Here? Okay. So good morning. I'm Josefina and I work at the Federal University of Campina Grande, Brazil. And um, so what I'm going to discuss here with you today are um, results from work that I've been doing with my students. And they're preliminary, and some of them are quite recent. And um, I wanted to bring them to an audience who could, I think, contribute a lot. So um, this is my intention today. So the topic is, does the cannery's current upwelling system affect the seasonal migration of the Atlantic ITCZ? And the motivation. Well, um, I, this is where I work now, around here. It's in the, the semi-arid northeast of Brazil. And this region has one short rainy season that's centered around March, April. These are these two towns here shown. So, and um, this short rainy season is due to the approximation of the Atlantic ITCZ. So March, April, that's when the ITCZ attains its southernmost position, because that's when the waters of the South Atlantic are warmest. And uh, that's what brings the rainfall. Um, because this region is very close to the southernmost ex um, limit of the migration of the ITCZ, um, rain, the rainfall season is very, very sensitive to the interannual variability in that migration. And uh, so, yeah, so you know, it's like the, you could say it's similar to the Sahel. So it's like the Brazilian Sahel. So predicting the rainfall season is a big deal for this, for this region. Um, and so I hear, I just put two examples of uh, satellite images for two different years, just one specific day. But here we can see this was a dry year, um, 2015. And the ITCZ is slightly further north than would be desirable, and the northeast is dry. And here, on a wet year, the ITCZ came further southwards, and it's a good year. You know? And so, um, actually, the, the value of a prediction is, um, what is done with the prediction is a, a whole other matter, because many times, um, a lot of the people who live in the, in the interior are subsistence farmers, and often they don't, there's no plan B, so they either plant or they plant because they need to run the risk. It's all probabilistic at the end of the day, and they need to run the risk of having a harvest. But they still use the forecast for, to build a resilient strategies so within the families. And you know, it's a, the social tissue is a, a whole other matter. But still, you know, it would be nice to provide um, good information. So why is the Northeast semi-arid if it's downstream from the trade winds all year round? Right, so there's always moisture, a lot of moisture coming in. These figures were not done for this talk, so they're not like, none of this is the average for the rainy season in itself, but still we can see that um, November to March, um, and then April to June, it's a little bit more humid, and then you know most of the time it's quite dry, and there's a lot of moisture coming in from the ocean all the time. And this moisture goes on and converges and, and produces rainfall further downstream. So why? And then one of the reasons is, I think the main reason is probably subsidence. So this region suffers from subsidence from the Hadley cell. It, the, the tip of the, the South Atlantic subtropical high um, often uh, is often over that region. And uh, so this is, um, had the, something like the Hadley cell, so a long-term mean meridional circulation, but averaged over what would be the Northeast so from 45 West to 35 West. And we can see a lot of subsidence close to the equator, right? So this is this is why there is a this is the driest season, but there's a pronounced there's a prolonged dry season, and this is a situation for March, April, May, which is somewhat better, and but due to the approximation of the ITCZ, which is this whole organized 
uh, system where you have uh, everything together, convergence, so you have the moisture supply, you have um, <coughs> upward motion, and then uh, making for um, lowering the pressure in the low levels, and then promoting further convergence of the trade winds and moisture supply and everything. So a positive feedback loop that can, um, that can uh, how can I say, overcome this subsidence situation. And there's also subsidence, there's often also subsidence from um, Walker-type circulations because of the intense rainfall in the western Amazon. So, uh, okay, so the rain from the northeast depends on the seasonal migration of the ITCZ. And how does this seasonal migration work? So it's the cloud band that goes together with the band of warmest waters over the ocean, the equatorial trough, and the trade wind convergence. All of these features, they don't exactly coincide, but they do move around together. And the rationale is pretty much, you know, as, as I understand it, is that the warmest waters reduce convective inhibition, then pretty much just the wind uh, generated turbulence is enough to lift the air to the free convection level. And then it triggers um, convection, and that lowers the low level pressure and uh, forces the trade wind con convergence, which provides moisture to convection, you know, and so feeds back. So the question is, what controls the extent of the southward migration of the Atlantic ITCZ? <clears throat> and so the standard answer is um, SST, right? Because SST would, be, would look like it's the, the outer forcing, what is able to reduce the convective inhibition and, and trigger spontaneous rainfall. Um, and then, okay, so what controls SST? And that would control then the, the, the extent of the seasonal migration of the ITCZ. So over the Atlantic, so you can imagine, well, I tend to think of it like it's, if you have two bowls of soup and they're at the same time, or if you have two bowls of soup in a still room, um, the warmest one will uh, heat the environment more because there will be a larger temperature difference between the, the liquid and the environment, and so there will be more heat transfer. But if, if you start to blow on one of the bowls of soup, then after a while it can be cooler than the other and still um, transfer more heat because of the turbulent fluxes. So you have like two um, mechanisms. One is the larger the SST, the more um, heat flux you will have to the atmosphere. And the other one is the larger the wind, the more heat flux you will have to the atmosphere. So over the Pacific, it's generally um, their uh, ocean, there's ocean dynamics controlling the SSD, and then that controls the heat transfer to the atmosphere. Whereas in the Atlantic, where the El Nino is not so pronounced, you generally have the, trade, the intensity of the trade winds playing a very big role in controlling the SSD. <clears throat> And then uh, Chang, 1997, he put this into a context where um, if you were to have um, opposing anomalies of SST in the tropical North Atlantic and the tropical South Atlantic, this would promote trade wind anomalies that would make them stronger in the South. You know, this would be the anomalous flow, but this would make the trade winds stronger in the South and weaker in the North. So weaker trades in the north would mean less heat transfer from the ocean to the atmosphere and therefore um, warmer ocean. And in the south, the more intense trades would mean more heat transfer and therefore a cooler ocean. So you would have the, the trade winds um, starting, the dis sorry, the SSD may be starting the disturbance, the trade winds responding in a way in which uh, to perpetuate and intensify the disturbance. Uh, so. There's a lot of talk about the tropical Atlantic SST dipole, and what this paper says is that, um, well, there is a statistical dipole, there's a statistical dipole signal, but in terms of physical mechanisms, mechanisms all you have is a positive feedback. You know that what, if you do have SST disturbances, the, trade, the wind disturbances will tend to perpetuate and accentuate them, so then, but you do need, um, uh, you don't have a mechanism to invert the signal. So you don't have a, a physical mechanism that's capable of inverting. If you have, by chance, a, a, an opposite situation in SST, then the mechanism works the other way around. So statistically, you end up getting a dipole, although there's no physical dipole. It's called wind evaporation feedback. Yeah. The 
I think so, yeah. Um, and well, so, but actually when you look at the correlation, so this is the correlation between wind and the SST gradient and uh, with different lags. And what you see here is that it's all positive. So that's the idea. There's no negative feedback. There's, it's always positive. But the, the atmosphere, the, the correlation is larger when the atmosphere precedes the ocean by a month. So generally speaking, the, these situations will be triggered by the atmosphere. So the atmosphere will lead. There will be anomalies in the trade winds. And then that will start the feedback loop with the ocean responding. <clears throat> so the question becomes, what controls the wind intensity? And then, OK, so this is a summary of a lot of work that was done. And a lot of it was done by Haston Rath. And so one of the things that he, the main thing that he proposes is um, a control by the Pacific Ocean on the North Atlantic SST, tropical SST. And get, that goes through an, uh, what he calls an atmospheric bridge. So it's a, um, it's a wave train that starts from uh, anomalous convection in the East Pacific. And then what it does is it, um, it promotes high level uh, convergence over the Atlantic in a position such that it will um, weaken the subtropical high and it's close to its southern boundary. So then it weakens the pressure gradient and therefore it weakens the trade winds. So that's how a warm Pacific would produce a warm northern Atlantic. And so with the warm northern Atlantic, this would tend to increase the southern trades and then give a cold southern Atlantic and, and shift the position of the ITCZ to the north, meaning less rainfall for the northeast. And then the opposite is also true. When you have a cold phase in the eastern Pacific, this, the, the teleconnection is such that you, you get a cold phase in the no tropical North Atlantic. And this, um, because, because the, the North Atlantic subtropical high becomes stronger, you get stronger trades and then a colder ocean. And the um, pushes the, the ITCZ southwards, and you get weaker trades in the, the south and a warmer ocean. So it all comes together. And this is uh, his. Uh, figure for the atmospheric bridge. So here is the, the signal in 200 millibars geopotential. And uh, this is divergence. So whereas this is Africa, so convergence and uh, yeah, I guess divergence here close to the over the tropics, which would mean downward motion. And then yeah, I don't I don't know what phase. Let's see what phase this is. in. <laughs> whatever phase this is in. So you're supposed to get um, divergence in the high levels to, in order to get a um, weaker North Atlantic subtropical high and convergence in the high levels to get the stronger subtropical high. I can't really distinguish that well. Um, OK, so this is Hastenrach. And then there's this other work um, by Saravanan and Chang. And what they did was they ran three experiments. Um, they, forced the, they forced the atmosphere with observed SSDs. And at, in the first moment, it was the global ocean forcing the global atmosphere. And then they removed, they used uh, monthly mean climatological SSDs for everywhere outside of 30 degrees north and 30 degrees so south. So interannual variability was only present in the tropics. And then they used that to force the atmosphere. And lastly, they used climatological, well, seasonal, um, monthly mean, long-term mean SSTs. Because you still keep the seasonal cycle, but you get rid of the interannual variability. So they used observed SSTs for the tropical Atlantic, and then climatological SSTs everywhere else. And so they ran these three experiments. And one of the things that they saw was that they then correlated um, SSTs with rainfall over the Northeast. And so the pattern is pretty much identical when you do global ocean, global atmosphere, and tropical ocean, tropical atmosphere. Sorry, tropical ocean, global atmosphere. But when you do the tropical Atlantic global atmosphere, you get the same signs but weaker correlations, especially in the North Atlantic. Now, the atmospheric bridge mechanism is obviously it's still there because you're using observed SSTs in the Atlantic. So 
when the atmospheric bridge was working and it affected the tropical Atlantic SST that, that's recorded in the data set. So you're still forcing um, rainfall with the atmospheric bridge mechanism. But what this points to is that, which this, what this suggests is that there's probably another mechanism too. So, you know, you still keep the, the atmospheric bridge working for the SST, but if there's a direct mechanism from um, Pacific SST to rainfall without having to go through the Northern Atlantic, then you lose that, and so they wouldn't vary together as well, SST and, and the rainfall. And so what they, what they propose is when they compare the, the, the experiment where the, the Pacific is also forced um, with the one where it's only the Atlantic, what they, what they see, they, they, it's kind of hard to see, but they, they see this classical gill response to a tropical um, um, heat source in the atmosphere with the two, two anticyclones, um, north and south on the equator. And then they say, okay, so if we have this, we, we're bound to have um, subsidence um, further to the east, and then that would be uh, promoting drought over the northeast. So you can think of it as two controls. I think this, like, you can think of the problem as two different controls, although they sometimes interlap, which would be the, whether the, the, STC, the ITCZ gets close enough or, or doesn't, and then whether you have stronger than usual subsidence in the northeast or not, because there are other minor uh, systems which will also promote rainfall, and in that case, they would be inhibited. So, like um, high level cyclonic vortices, and then later in the year, the easterly waves. So, you have these things in play too, and they would be inhibited by stronger subsidence. Okay, so, you know, this, was, this is the scenario. And then it's like uh, sort of well rounded, and it all makes sense. But then, <laughs> Then the forecast is really, really bad. <laughs> I think the forecast is pretty bad. Because, um, say, this is supposed to be a dry year. Well, and then the forecast is also bad for the other regions. So you could argue that, you know. But anyway, this is what um, called my attention, that this is supposed to be a dry year in the Northeast. And still you have like a 60% chance of rainfall average or above average rainfall. So that's, um, that's uncomfortable. And uh, there is also a political issue because you cannot generate um, panic. If you, uh, a drought forecast for the Northeast is very, it's, it has a strong emotional effect. But it's still pretty bad because when you go to these meetings, these uh, seasonal forecast meetings, you start to notice that it's not just a question of the models not, um, okay, maybe this is a difficult mechanism for the models. There's, there, it's very involved, there are different stages. The model has to get a lot of stuff right. But um, what you see when you go to the meetings is that the forecasters don't really have much more to go on. So they, can, they don't have an opinion that can differ from the model very much. All they do is look at the MJO and forecast if it's going to be, in a, if it's going to be a signal of uh, downward air motion or upward air motion, and there's not much to, to do beyond that. So what was our approach? So we thought, okay, maybe if this is all um, accounted for and it's all understood, maybe the question is how do these different mechanisms combine and which one prevails in different situations, right? So maybe that could be helpful. And so what we decided to do was look at um, individual years as case studies, so individual rainy seasons as case studies, and then test these different mechanisms for their strength and to see which one was prevailing. And so we calculated things like, um, well, anomalies of rainfall and uh, SST and convergence, diverge, high-level divergence and um, heat fluxes and all of these kinds of anomalies to have an idea of what was going on. And so what we found was the following. This is probably the, be the best situation. This is like, um, so this was 1985. It was actually a strong La Nina year. And yes, the, the, this is anomaly, um, anomalous 100 millibar winds. So we have a, a much stronger North Atlantic subtropical high. And it does seem like it's cooling the, the tropical Atlantic, right? One sorry. Yes. 1,000. Yeah. What did I say? 1,000. Oh, sorry. 1,000. And it does seem like it's cooling the tropical Atlantic. But then we have this really strong cold tongue. And it's coming from the coast of, uh, 
I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, from the coast, but this is uh, the Canary's current upwelling system. It's quite. I have a picture for it. It's quite wide in terms of latitudes, and this is a part of it. And uh, so it does seem like so the anomalies are kind of they're appearing from the coast, and they do seem to get advected and to affect the whole basin, right? And if you notice the trade winds, yes, they're stronger and the, the water is cooler over the whole um, tropical Atlantic, but it's really from this, from the southern part of these anomalies that the trade winds diverge. There, there's an anomalous divergence and then they converge in the South Atlantic where it's warmer. And you see that the rainfall <coughs> response is very clear. So the correspondence with the rainfall anomalies is very clear. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, because it does. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I will. I would. Because there's a scale, so, you know, it could be more quantitative. But it's just, it's behind this other figure. Maybe at some other point we'll be able to see the scale. Um, yeah, so this is dry and this is wet, right? And this is cold and this is uh, warm. So, yeah, so the, this is, it's always March, April, May, so it's always the rainy season for the Northeast. It's always when the ITCZ should be at its, it should be somewhere around here, sorry, um, here or here. And so these anomalies will tell, tell us how it's shifted. It shifts around its southernmost position always. Um, okay, so, and then these are the, so, Uh, uh, doesn't okay. Oh, uh, maybe okay. Yeah. And here are the heat flux. This is a uh, all the heat fluxes together. So sensible and uh, latent and also irradiative. It's everything together. Um, the convention is downward heat flux is positive. And of course, then the, the, the field in the tropics will be negative because it's always the ocean heating the atmosphere. And so if we have a negative anomaly, it's, um, it means that it's less, sorry, more heat being um, given from the ocean to the atmosphere, right? And if you have a positive anomaly, that means there's less heat being given from the ocean to the atmosphere. So what we expect, as we said earlier, is, um, if there's if there's if the mechanism if the if winds are driving the SST anomalies, then we expect um, uh, upward heat fluxes to be associated with cooler SSTs. And if it's the SST anomalies that are driving the heat flux ones, then you expect um, cooler SSTs to be related to less upward um, heat transfer transport. So over most of the tropical Atlantic, we see um, the, probably the winds driving the SST anomalies as much as this uh, we can. I, I don't, I'm not that sure how, how trustworthy this field is, really, from the reanalysis. And then, but over exactly where the, the canneries of welling um, anomalies appears to be, we have um, cooler SSTs associated with less heat being transferred into the atmosphere. So it's not the wind that's cooling the SST over this region, right? Okay, so also this, um, so this upwelling, one of the important mechanisms is Ekman transport, and it's forced by northeastern trades. So this uh, upwelling, the southern, it's quite wide, um, and the southern part of it is, has a strong seasonality, and it only exists around um, April, um, March, April. A little bit, it's a little bit wider time gap, but it's around March, April, because that's when the, SS, the ITCZ is further south, and that's when the trade winds in this um, equatorial region, let's say, have a northeasterly component, and then the Ekman, Ekman transport will drive the water away from the coast, right? So it does fit well, but then I have to go on and um, calculate the Ekman transport, I suppose. But it does seem that it fits well 
um, that we have uh, more upwelling with um, this anomaly, so this northeastward anomaly. So what could be happening is we could have, yes, the, the, the South Atlantic subtropical high influencing the, the position of the ITCZ, but with an intermediate step where it forces anomalous upwelling in the Canaries current system, and that cools the ocean, and that's where the wind diverges from, right? So, and that's where you get the dry, um, uh, the dry anomalies, so the shift of the ITCZ. Uh, this is a picture of the of the upwelling. So it goes from like 22 north to um, 10 north, I guess, and they subdivide it into different regions. Yeah, but because they have slightly different um, mechanisms. But this, I think, this this region is the one that uh, this um, band has the strongest seasonality, and it really it depends on the migration of the ITCZ. But then the question becomes: Well, there are several questions. So I'm going to show you a number of other years. So I had like a 29-year sample. I think it was from 1983 to 2011. And, um, and then I, I uh, extracted from this sample the years where we can see this working in some way. Either because the, but uh, as I said, these are preliminary results. So with my student, we had done, we had gone from doing a whole bunch of uh, correlations, statistics, and this and that, and not really getting anywhere new with the problem to doing some case studies, so it was, um, and then we did like five different case studies with these different fields. But then this showed up and then I decided to see if it would be recurrent and then I have um, figures for these fields for every year but not for all of the other fields that we were looking at too, so I don't have the heat fluxes for every year, unfortunately. But okay, so this is 1983, this was a very strong El Nino. And then what we see here is possibly a suppression of the, of the upwelling. But we, we do see here a stronger equatorial upwelling in the southern uh, hemisphere. This, I guess, should work a lot like the Pacific. So it would be driven by zonal winds, right? And so there's this cold anomaly. And we see the, OK, the subtropical um, high is uh, weaker than usual, and maybe, yes, that does cool the, the tropical North Atlantic. The tropical North Atlantic. But it does seem that the relevant action takes place closer to the equator, where you have the cool anomalies and then the warm anomalies and the divergence and the convergence of the wind. And here, there's a, a, a clear signal of rainfall suppression, but then we don't get that much um, enhanced rainfall. But you know, there's a very strong Nino, so there could be subsidence. You know, there's still, there's more things to check about this year. Oh, I do have the fluxes, yeah. So uh, this, you know, this region where we have these cold anomalies, they were um, of less, yeah, less heat transport to the atmosphere, which means to say that it wasn't, this was not wind produced, right? So likely upwelling, really. Um, then there's 1986, uh, and it's always the same story um, for these years that I've chosen. You do have stuff happening in the tropics, you know, that comes from the extra tropics, but then what really says where, what, how the, the, the ITCC is going to shift is what happens a lot, a lot closer to the equator because you see you have these trade with anomalies, but they're kind of pretty much the same, the same, the same, and then they start to diverge and then they converge in the southern hemisphere and they seem to be responding to this gradient. This S is very much equatorial SST gradient and the uh, rainfall shifts. And then the situation can be the opposite. And it's so the, the message is this correspondence between equatorial SST gradient divergence and convergence of the trades in the equatorial strip and the, the shift in the rainfall. And it just, it works pretty well there for all of these cases, you know, either with the one sign or the opposite. So this looks like an Atlantic El Nino. There was not that much happening in the North Tropical Atlantic, but then there's this divergence and it doesn't go very far, it just converges. Um, 
a little bit to the north. And then, yeah, somewhat like the, yeah, the opposite situation. Yeah. And here we just have, we seem to have a suppression of this upwelling. There's not so much happening in the northern hemisphere, but then the trade winds respond by flowing into um, this warmer water and, uh, and the rainfall responds too. And here it's the same. So suppressed upwelling probably, and then enhanced upwelling. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but <laughs> could be the suppressed, I mean, could be suppressed upwelling here, or it could just be the wind in this case, I'm not sure. And then from north to south, and then from south to north, this is clearly suppressed upwelling, I'd say. And then from north to south, and it just works for a number of years. Um, so pre oh, I think I have the, yeah. Yeah, so this is suppressed upwelling, at least up here. And then the, how, what does the rainfall do? There is a reduced rainfall over, um, I guess, where the upwelling was around um, climatology. And then this was just not there. So the rainfall sh um, runs away from the south. Yeah, so um, it's uh, from 20, 29 years, there's like 17 of them where you see this equatorial, it seems like it's more of an equatorial dipole than a tropical dipole. That's what it appears to be. And uh, so there are a few questions and I would um, love um, any feedback on how to go about them. So one issue is, <clears throat> Is this the is this the real uh, main mechanism? Is it an equatorial dipole? And in that case, maybe it's a uh, wind convergence as much as SST. And it does seem to work like that for El Nino, where oftentimes you have these very strong anomalies of SST. But when you look at the field itself, for some El Ninos, the gradient is very very weak. There's not really there's a a warming in the in the central Pacific state, and it just seems like an enormous pool of warm water, but the convection still shifts. So I always thought of it as being that the the convection, the you get these this spread out of the warm water because of weakening of the trades, and when you weaken the trades, what you also do is you shift the convergence, and then you trigger you just trigger convection at a different point. Although there's no real strong SST gradient. And so um, <clears throat> on the interannual time scale, it does seem to just it does, just seems to happen that you will have a response of the ITCZ to this equatorial um, dipole. But um, could it also be that within for every rainy season, these upwellings, they work as feedbacks where the canaries current, the southern part of the canaries current upwelling will exist when the ITCZ shifts to the south because that's when you get the northeastern trades over the coast of Africa. And then because it appears, then it incre enhances con um, convergence and convection in the SST when it shifts to the south. So just a part of the seasonal cycle as a positive feedback. And, and then lastly, um, it could be that in, in, in some cases, the, the canary's current upwelling works as an intermediate step between the North Atlantic subtropical high and the ITCZ. So it would be, um, in some cases, necessary to have that in order to get the influence from the extratropics to the equatorial region. <clears throat> 